to get connected and thank you for joining us today. And uh, as we get connected, we want to make sure that everyone knows that they're welcome here, welcome here at Anchor Church to our worship service, but also we want you to know that you're welcome into our lives, welcome into this church family. And so we're hoping that that few minutes gives you a chance to connect and then possibly uh, over, the, over the coming weeks that as you meet a few people that you get a chance to go out to lunch and that we become a part of each other's lives. And so we're just grateful to meet you today and glad that you're here with us. Well, my name's Chris and I'm the lead pastor here at Anchor Church. And I'm not going to be speaking today, so I'm going to introduce to you our guest speaker for the morning. And so I'm excited to introduce uh, him. And as I introduce him, I, I also want you to just, um, I, I, want you, I want you to think about all that, that God has done really in our lives leading up to this. And he and I were talking even this week and last week just about the way that things go in life. And so I was so encouraged to hear of his faith and he and his wife and how they're, they're journeying in faith. And so I, I just became more and more excited to have him. And so what I also know is just how hospitable our church family is. And so my hope is really that they feel uh, like we have given to them a warm welcome and given to them as much as I know we're going to receive from them today. So Heath, would you come up? Heath and Lindsay Kruger are, are actually uh, live in this area, part of this area, and he's been in ministry for a number of years and served the Lord faithfully, actually was at Spring Branch over the last couple of years and led them through the pandemic, which was hard for me, hard for anybody to do, but you did it faithfully, uh, and our team was watching, really we just sort of watching from Facebook, but then even you and I have become uh, friends because we went to a family camp together a number of years ago, and then I've run into you in the community a few times, and even recently had the chance to get a lunch a few times, and I just, I respect you and Lindsay so much and appreciate your faithfulness to him and just your, your perseverance and just commitment to follow him wherever he leads, so Thank I can't you. wait to hear yeah. from you. Thanks for having me, Chris. Yes, sir. Let's give it up for Chris and his leadership. I'm so... It's important to give honor where honor is due. God calls us to honor those leaders that he has put in our midst. And so thank you, Chris, for your humble, gentle, loving leadership. Uh, I've experienced that personally. I know each of you who've crossed paths with him. And thank you to the elder team and just all the leaders here at Anchor. Uh, I know Lindsay and I have felt welcome here. Uh, this morning I told Chris backstage, you can always tell about the health of a church 15 minutes before, you know, the church actually starts, the service actually starts. And uh, just the smiles and hugs and high fives uh, have been all around this morning. So thank you for having me. I'm truly humbled, truly honored to be here. Let's pray before we dive into the word together. Pray with me. God, thanks so much for this day, this day that you have created. Lord, none of us are here on earth and none of us are here this morning on accident, God, you have made us on purpose for a purpose. You have plans to prosper us, not to harm us, plans to give us a hope and a future. You are a personal God who walks alongside us through life's difficult times. And so we thank you for your presence here this morning. Thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that you would open up our eyes so that we may see the wonderful things in your word so that we may be more and more like you and your son Jesus every day. I bless this time together. And all God's people said, amen, amen, amen. amen. Well, back in uh, 2007, I believe it was November, uh, a guy named Mike Neal uh, bought a brand new Toyota Tacoma, and he was super excited because it was a reliable car, so he heard, did a lot of research, and uh, he, he was, he, uh, his responsibility was to deliver these, this nuclear medicine uh, for PET scans all around the southeast, North Carolina and Virginia. And in fact, uh, about 500 miles per day is what he averaged delivering these, uh, this important medicine. Fast forward a few years, and just recently he crossed over 1.5 million miles with that Toyota Tacoma. Amazing, isn't it? My brother's a, a Toyota dealer up in, up in Michigan. He paid me nothing for this commercial, this advertisement. But uh, he just crossed over 1.5 million miles. Pretty amazing stuff. I mean, talk about a reliable car, something that does what you want it to do. Uh, back in 2004, I bought a 97 Toyota 4Runner. 
And uh, uh, we are at 285,000 miles right now, and we are determined to get, to get up to 300,000. Who knows, we may make up to a million and a half. We'll see. But uh, this, the magical three S's, you gotta have, you know, it's gotta start, uh, it's gotta steer, and it's gotta stop, right? Those are the three S's. So far, so good. Although a few weeks ago, uh, I was on my way to my son's soccer practice, and all of a sudden we see this like smoke billowing out of the hood. And heard this rattling sound. It sounded expensive, looked expensive. I looked at Red, I'm like, this is not good. And so we, we kind of, uh, we make it into the parking lot barely. Um, and uh, I'm over the hood looking at it. I'm not a car guy, any car people out there. I just filled it up with gas, filled up with oil. One time I filled it up with too much oil. That was a mistake. Uh, but uh, uh, so, you know, a, a, a couple of days later, uh, Lindsay, my wife, uh, she meets us, meets us there at the car. And so we, we make our way to the mechanic, which is like three miles away. We were determined not to, to, uh, to, to hire a tow truck driver. We were determined not to have this thing towed. We can make it to the mechanic. And long story short, uh, we stopped three or four different times in the middle of the intersection. Witch Duck intersection, I believe we, we stopped like twice in that one. We made it like a half mile, and then, then it would stall, and then it would start up. Light would turn green. I would put the pedal to the metal. We'd get through the light. Uh, we'd, you know, cars would pass us, and the smoke was billowing from, from the hood. It was crazy. But we made it. We made it to the mechanic without having to hire a tow truck driver. Uh, but uh, it was quite, quite the adventure. Anybody have a car with lots of personality like that? Um, who knows? In a few years, I, I, may be, uh, I may be sharing with you that we made it up to a million and a half miles. We'll see. But um, how many of you can, can, can relate to that? Maybe it wasn't your car. Maybe you got a much more reliable, hopefully, car than, than I do. Um, life sometimes doesn't do what you want it to do, right? Life sometimes is like a 97 Toyota 4Runner, and you're trying to get to the mechanic, you're trying to get it fixed. You've got your destination in mind. You've got your goal in mind. And it, you have some curveballs along the way. Some storms come along the way. And life stalls in the middle of an intersection. Sometimes life does not do what you want it to do. Better yet, sometimes God doesn't do what we want God to do. What happens? What do we do when God doesn't do what we want God to do? to do? How many of you have asked that question? How many of you have felt that recently, maybe the last couple of years as Chris shared? We've noticed that there were a lot of things that are just out of our control. COVID happened. And we, we, we find ourselves at this point in time where we're like, man, we had this dream, we had this goal, we had this destination, it had, had this and this and this that I hoped would happen. And all of a sudden it just screeches to a halt and life just stalls and the engine turns off and you're stranded and you wonder how you got there. Maybe some of you can relate to that. Maybe some of you uh, are in the middle of a job, a job transition. Maybe you lost a job. Maybe you know somebody who lost their job. Maybe some of you are experiencing a health crisis. Maybe there's a diagnosis that's just kind of up in the air. You don't have answers. Maybe it's a relationship that just suddenly ended and uh, maybe, there's a, there, maybe there's some hard feelings and uh, maybe there's distance between you and somebody that you never thought was possible. So maybe it's relational, maybe it's financial, maybe it has something to do with your health. But we come to this point where we realize that life just does not do what we want it to do. No matter how hard we try, and then it gets to be a spiritual level. And we say, God, I thought you loved me. I thought you cared about you. I thought you cared about me. What do we do when God doesn't do what we want God to do? When his plans aren't our plans, when his timing isn't our timing. A number of years ago, uh, Lindsay and I, we, we, we got married, 2003. We married for almost 19 years, praise God. She's amazing, so thankful. We got three beautiful kids. Um, but there was a point in time where we were like ready to start a family and we had, we had a few miscarriages along our journey and it was very, very difficult. Maybe you know somebody, maybe you've experienced miscarriages. Um, one out of five couples experience a miscarriage. I don't know if you knew that, but we were just on our knees just crying out to God, God, why, why, why is this happening? And 
It was hard. It was dark. We were filled with fear and doubt and disappointment and discouragement. God wasn't doing what we wanted God to do. Maybe you can relate to that today. Here's the thing. God doesn't want us to trust in our circumstances, just like that song we just sang. We've got to trust in his love for us. His love and his presence needs to be our firm foundation because when the storms come, when there is trouble in life, when the curveballs come our way, when our car dies in the middle of the intersection, may we have our trust in the unchanging character of God. By the way, circumstances change all the time. Things are out of our control. But you know what doesn't change? The character, the essence, the quality of God and his love for us. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is our rock. He is our foundation. May we place our trust in him, not in the changing circumstances around us. See, sometimes I, I think that our, our love for God, our belief in God is conditional. <laughs> It's contingent on our lives lining up, right, with his plans. Let's flip it on its head. What if if God's love for us was contingent on our behavior, right? What what if he he, he counted our wrongs? What what if he kept track of, of our sins and our mistakes and he huddled against us? And every day we had to earn back his love. That's like every other religion in the world, right? But God didn't come to start a religion. He came to start a relationship. And we can rest assured every day by grace through faith that he loves us. It's an unconditional, never stopping, never breaking, never giving up, always and forever kind of love. It's a covenantal love. It's not a conditional love. And so may our love for God be the same. May it not be contingent on circumstances or a certain situation lining up. Well, all throughout the scriptures, from Genesis to Revelation, we find God's people struggling with the same battle. God shows up miraculously. He does the impossible. He does the supernatural, right? Uh, For example, the parting of the Red Sea, God's people were delivered and rescued from slavery in Egypt, 300, 400 years of slavery and bondage, and God rescued them from Egypt, ushered them miraculously through the Red Sea, and they praised God like we did this morning. And then a few days later, they complained to that same God, right? God, why did you bring us out here? It's hot. It's a dry and weary land. Why are we taking this long detour to the promised land? And they longed for their home back in Egypt. God's like, hey, remember that time I rescued you from slavery and delivered you, you know, through through the Red Sea? All throughout the scriptures, we find God's people turning away from God and turning back to God, turning away from God and turning back to God. And then a few weeks ago, we saw uh, the most, most incredible event in the history of mankind, right? Many of you gathered here and you worshiped and you praised God for the cross, for the crucifixion, for, for the fact that, that God willingly, like a lamb led to the slaughter, voluntarily, he laid down his life for you and for me. And he paid the price for our sins once and for all. He was tortured. He, was, he suffocated under the weight of his own body. He was mocked. He was spat on. He laid down his life on the cross for you and for me. And whoever should believe in him will not perish but have everlasting life. That was Good Friday. And then we know a couple days later, we praise God for conquering death, for defeating death. Death has no sting and no victory thanks to Jesus rising from the grave. Once and for all, once and for all, we know that our sins have been paid for and that when our life ends here on earth, we can spend forever with him, with God in eternity. Praise praise God, huh? And we get to have a relationship with our creator and our savior and our sustainer. So the disciples, the disciples deserted Jesus at the cross 
But then when he rose from the grave, they were so pumped. They were so excited. They're like, all right, here we go. Let's do this. And, you know, over the course of 40 days, Jesus uh, revealed himself multiple ways at multiple times to multiple people. And the disciples were fired up. They were amped up. They were like, yes, let's start this revolution. Let's flip this world upside down. Let's tell everybody, every square inch of the world about what Jesus did for us. And they're so pumped. They're so excited. And then we, we find in Acts chapter 1, if you want to turn with me, we'll have the scripture up on the screen as well. Acts chapter 1, they're like stretching out. They're ready to take the world by storm and bring about God's kingdom on earth. And we find, uh, we find them asking Jesus this question in Acts chapter 1. And by the way, Acts is really just uh, the Acts of the Apostles, Acts of the Disciples. But uh, more than that, it's the Acts of the Holy Spirit through God's people. I'd encourage you to read the book of Acts. Uh, I think that Chris is going to be uh, taking you on a journey the next few weeks through uh, Pentecost and uh, the early church. I mean, what an exciting time to be alive, right? Hundreds and thousands of people receiving Christ and getting baptized. And uh, what an exciting time to be alive. And so Luke, uh, Luke continues his gospel and, 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 and writes the book of Acts. He was a companion of Paul on his missionary journeys and also a, a doctor. So he's very detailed in his description of, of what's going on at this time. So anyway, uh, back to Acts chapter 1, verse 6. Uh, All the disciples gathered around them and asked him, Lord, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Here we go. This is what we've been waiting for, training for, preparing for. This is it. The time has come. And Jesus (laughs) calmly, gently, firmly replies to them, and he addresses the, the errors in their question. In fact, John Calvin, the theologian, uh, reformer, said uh, uh, in regards to this question, the disciples asked Jesus, he said, there are just as many errors in this question as there are words. <laughs> and he said to them gently, firmly, he says, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So he says, it's not for you to know the dates or times, right? And that's what he says to us in a way, right? How many of you would love to know the dates and times of everything in your life? I I know I can look at my watch and say, God, it'd be great if you could take care of this, this, and this by the weekend, That'd be great. And he's got his master calendar, right? And he sees the whole picture. He's like, I know what's best for you. I'm your heavenly father. You are my kids. I know what's best for you, according to my timetable. That's what Jesus reminds them of. He says, the the, the kingdom, right? And he spent more more time in his ministry describing what the kingdom was going to be like. And it wasn't going to happen just at the snap of the finger, right? He compared it like a farmer spreading seeds, Seeds take time. Seeds take time to to take root and to grow and to come up. And he compares that to the kingdom. So he says, uh, it's not right now. It'll take some time. And then he also talks about um, the word restore. The disciples use, hey, hey, is it it time for the kingdom of Israel to be restored? And really they were referring to political power. Power. They wanted Jesus to be that that, that warring king, right? Riding in a chariot and taking taking the world by force. They wanted uh, wanted him to be the king in the political sense. But Jesus was talking about spiritual power. He was talking about a spiritual kingdom. And then they said, hey, uh, can we restore the kingdom to Israel right now? Israel. Israel. They were limiting God's kingdom and his love to just the Jewish people, just to God's people. And Jesus is like, no, this is for everybody. How many of you know that the gospel is for everybody? No matter what your skin color is, no matter what your socioeconomic background is, no matter what you've done in the past, the kingdom of God, the gospel is for everyone at all times. All means all, and that's all, all means for everyone. 
And it's spiritual power. It's a spiritual kingdom, and it takes time. Acts 1, uh, verse 9, after he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. Imagine this scene. You're on the Mount of Olives, the rest of the disciples, and Jesus tells you that he'll be back. (laughs) And all of a sudden, he just takes off. He elevates, levitates up into the sky, right? And you're just staring up there, you're like, he said he's coming back, right? He's coming back soon. You're looking at your watch. The disciples are gazing up into the sky and he, basically the ultimate mic drop moment, right? Drops the mic and flies away. Pretty cool. A cloud obstructs their sight. He disappears. The disciples are looking longingly up into the sky, gazing up there intently. Now you see him, now you don't. I just want to pause here for a second. What is, what is your cloud today? What is, what is obstructing your view of God and his presence and his love for you? What is that circumstance? Maybe it happened years ago. Maybe it happened recently. Maybe it's, maybe it's something that has happened in your life and you're kind of holding that against God. There's resentment, there's bitterness, there's anger. Let me tell you today that that, that, that God wants to use that cloud. God has allowed that cloud to be in your life. I was sitting on the beach with a couple of my friends a few days ago, and we were talking about adversity and trials and storms and how how in in the book of James, God calls those storms perfect gifts. And he encouraged us to, to take joy in those trials. Maybe God allowed that cloud in your life to reveal his goodness to you, to force you to get on your knees in complete dependence, complete submission and surrender to him. How many of you know when when life is going your way, you hit cruise control and you kind of pat yourself on the back and you look in the mirror and kind of praise yourself and thank yourself, right? Right? But God wants us to get on our knees and sometimes he allows the trials in life to happen in order for us to be more mature and more complete and to depend on him and to to believe without seeing, right? In Hebrews, we read that faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. See, authentic faith, true faith is trusting in who God is apart from circumstances. See, when when God doesn't do what we want him to do, he is always who we need him to be, amen? When God doesn't do what we want him to do, he is always who we need him to be. So what is that cloud for you today? And maybe God has allowed that cloud to be in your life, to get you on your knees, to draw you closer to him. Well, they were looking intently up into the sky, verse 10, as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who's been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you've seen him go into heaven. They were just staring and waiting for Jesus to return, right? These angels showed up and they said, hey, you got a job to do. See, I think one of the most powerful things that Jesus ever did was he left. He just took off. He just dropped the mic and just flew away. (laughs) We can't see him. We can't feel him. We can't touch him. We can't smell him in the physical earthly sense. But God is just as real today in this room than he was when he walked this earth in, in flesh and bones. He is real and he is with us and he is for us. And if God is for us, who can be against us? And he's given us a job to do. And he promises promises us that he'll be with us, that he will come again someday. In fact, uh, 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 that, that same night when I was with my son Red at the soccer complex, it was like half the sky was like cloudy and dark and half the sky was like sunny and clear. It was really weird. It was beautiful. Um, he told me, Dad, it, it kind of looks like Jesus is coming back. 
kind of looks like Jesus is about ready to come back out of the sky. And I said, yes, you're right, buddy. Please, Jesus, come back soon. I love that. See, being fully alive here on earth means being fully aware of eternity. It means setting our hearts on things above and, and longing for that day when Jesus comes back and realizing that we've got to orient our lives around things that have eternal implications. We're not guaranteed tomorrow. We've got to live every day to the fullest because life is like a mist that appears and then disappears. God wants us to, to live this life for him and for his glory and for others' good. And so the angels are like, hey, boys, you got a job to do. Get back to Jerusalem and get to work. There are hundreds and thousands of people out there that don't know what happened on the cross. They don't know what happened with the resurrection. You need to go tell them. See, sometimes we're so uh, heavenly minded, we're like looking up at the sky that we're no earthly good, right? He's given you gifts. He's given you abilities and talents to spread the good news of the gospel here, near, and far. Verse 12, the, the disciples uh, returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day walk from the city. It's about five-eighths of a mile. Can you imagine that conversation along the way, right? They're just walking along and, and they say things like, man, I had hoped, I had hoped that, that Jesus was going to stay and that we were going uh, we to start his kingdom right now and that he was going to take it by force and get rid of the Romans and all that. There's a disappointment, a little bit of discouragement. I had hoped, I had hoped, I had hoped. But were they going to remember God's promises? Were they going to remember that they were to be God's witnesses to the world? And I was just imagining this week, uh, you know, Peter's saying something like, but wasn't that flying thing legit? That was pretty cool. That was pretty amazing. Maybe you didn't actually ask that. The disciples returned to Jerusalem and what did they do? How did they respond? How did they respond? Verse 13, when they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James, and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. So as we close today, I just want to give you three quick, three quick things that we need to do. When life doesn't turn out the way we want it to, when God doesn't do what we want him to do, how should we respond as believers? Well, I think the way the disciples ended up responding was the way we need to respond today. The first thing they did, they gathered with people, particular people. How many of you have particular people in your life? A circle of people who have your back. We don't know what's around the corner, right? But we do know who's around the corner, and that's our community, people who know us and love us. And we know, of course, that God is around that corner. We don't know when that trouble, when that storm's going to come, but we do know, we do have control over, are the relationships in our lives. People who can carry our burdens when life gets heavy. When Lindsay and I had those miscarriages, we had a, we had a circle of people that dropped off meals and um, they just carried our burdens. It was, it was that one another kind of community that we all need, right? Church isn't just coming to a Sunday morning and sitting in a row. It's about being in a circle of people, people who can look you in the eye and say, I love you, I'm with you, you're not alone in this. A couple weeks ago, uh, uh, one of my friends, um, Joe, he uh, had some health complications. He was waiting on a diagnosis and um, he just said, Heath, thank you. Thank you for walking alongside me in this, in this struggle. Thank you that, 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 that you are lifting me up in prayer <clears throat> and that me and my wife and our kids, we aren't experiencing this alone. We are better together, friends. We are stronger together. We need particular people in our lives, especially when life gets difficult. People who fully know us and fully love us, who can walk alongside of us. And 2 Corinthians 1 uh, says, comfort others just the way God has comforted you. And that word comfort in the Greek literally means walking alongside you. I love that. You have people walking alongside of you. We need particular people in our lives. We're not meant to fly solo. Being a Christian is not a solo sport. It's a team sport. 
On the flip side of that, maybe there's some people in your life who you just need to set some boundaries, right? 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, uh, he says, do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. You are what you eat. If you want to see your future, look at your friends, right? For good or for bad. We need to uh, be intentional, be purposeful about who those people are in our lives. Who are we being influenced by? Who are we allowing into that tight circle? Who can point us towards Jesus and his promises? Then they all joined together, verse 14, and constantly in prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Steadfastly continuing. That's what this word constant in prayer means. That they just, it was every day, all day conversation with God. It wasn't just sprinkled in before meals, or it wasn't just this uh, uh, 9 911 in the foxhole prayer every now and then. I'm guilty of that. It was an every day, all day practicing the presence of God. Is that what your prayer life looks like? We need to go into battle every day, armed with the Holy Spirit and with God's presence, because we don't know what the next second will hold. I love this example. They join together constantly in prayer. See, we're we're really good at worrying, right? We, we are we are a care. We are care warriors, right? We need to be prayer warriors. (laughs) We're really good at just over and over again worrying about things, worrying about things. But what if we replace those worries with prayer? What if we went to God continually every day and said, God, I need you. I'm a, a week apart from you. Apart from you, I can do nothing. May we be reminded of who God is. Every day. And finally, not just particular people, not just persistent prayer, but they reflected on God's perfect promises for their lives. What was the perfect promise? Well, God, uh, through Jesus, shares in Acts chapter 1, verse 4, he says, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days he'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. He promises the Holy Spirit. He doesn't just ascend into heaven and then poof, we're, we're, we're left on our own, right? He gives us his presence. His very presence is in us. This dynamite power, this explosive power, his presence is within each of us. And prayer is a way that we can unlock that power in our lives every day. And the Bible, God's word is the only blameless pure, uh, perfect word that we will hear on this side of heaven. We can rely on this, friends. This is not fake news. This is authentic. This is real. May you pour yourselves into God's word every day and know that he never breaks a promise. His yes is his yes, his no is his no. And by the Holy Spirit, he is with you every single day. May we reflect on his promises. May we pour ourselves into his word every day. Particular people, do you have those in your life? Persistent prayer. Are you praying constantly? And are you reflecting on God's perfect promises through his word? May you know that the Holy Spirit is with you every day. So last night I had a chance to, uh, to go to Zach Williams' concert. It was awesome. He shared his story, how he had hit rock bottom, how he was an alcoholic and a drug addict and his marriage, his family was on the rocks. And, and God brought him to a breaking point. And uh, I don't know if you've heard the song Rescue Story, powerful song. I've heard it for, for a little while, but he shared his testimony last night and it's God's rescue story for him. And I just want to close with a couple words and then we'll pray. This is what he says in the song. There I was empty handed, crying out from the pit of despair. There you were in the shadows, holding out your hand. You met me there. And now where would I be without you? Where would I be, Jesus? You were the voice in the desert, calling me out in the dead of night, fighting my battles for me. You are my rescue story, lifted me up from the ashes carried my soul from death to life, bringing me from glory to glory. You are my rescue story.
God is our superhero and he wants to rescue you. Whatever darkness you are experiencing, whatever uh, doubt or fear or whatever uh, you're experiencing right now in life, God wants to rescue you from that. Through his promise of the Holy Spirit, through particular people, through his word, God, our superhero, wants to rescue us and bring us out of the darkness and into the light. And he's got great things in store. May we know that God is behind that cloud. My daughter the other day, uh, I said, the sun's not out today, it's cloudy. And she'd been studying clouds in class and she said, dad, the sun is always out. You just can't see it behind the cloud. And I was like, that's good, that'll preach. (laughs) The sun is always out, right? May you know that whatever cloud you're experiencing in this life right now, that the sun is behind the cloud. God is behind that cloud and he is working and he is moving and he will provide for your every need. Amen? Let's pray. God, we thank you. We thank you from the bottom of our hearts that that you are good. When life doesn't feel good, when the circumstances are not going our way, may we trust in you in who you are. And may we fill our lives with your promises. And like the disciples, may we invite particular people into our our lives. May May we bathe ourselves in prayer. And may we know that we're not alone because we have your Holy Spirit guiding us each day. God, we thank you. We praise you for who you are and what you're doing in our lives. Pray all this in your son's beautiful, precious name, Jesus. Everybody said. Amen. Amen. Will you guys thank Heath for preaching for us? Thank you. Hey, I meant to do this earlier. I wanted to pray over you. (laughs) I got excited about you coming to preach. and I meant to pray for you guys, but I'm so grateful for you. I've seen you actually be surrounded by people. I've Mm -hmm. seen you uh, pray. And I know that even in our conversations, the way you talk about just being committed to the Lord and you're just Mm -hmm. believing his promises. Mm -hmm. It's really something to watch someone believe what they're preaching. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what we saw today. You've encouraged me with some things. Even when we were talking about this message, the cloud that came between Mm -hmm. them and Jesus, I just... Yeah. Hadn't thought of it that way. And there's yeah. so many things that do from time to time obstruct my view. Thanks, Pat. But thank you for Appreciate that. You. Let me Chris. pray. Lord, thank you for the Kruger family. Thank you for Heath, my brother and friend. Thank you for his wife and his children and what you're doing in their lives too. I just pray, God, that you would continue to uh, go before them, that you would lead them, God, that you'd protect them. I, I do pray for a special kind of protection. I pray for uh, your provision in their lives, a special kind of provision. And what I mean by that is, Lord, I pray that they would have a keen awareness of your presence. And as you protect them, that you would reveal your protection to them. As you provide for them, you would show them uh, that it's you providing, you leading the way, and that they would see you and take great confidence in that, Lord. So thank you for how you've led them. And I pray, Lord, that you'd continue to lead them and bless them. Thank you for using him today to bless us and serve us this way. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We love you, brother. Thank you.